<laughs> All right. Well, well, like everyone is starting to realize, we're we're, we're getting into this this place where uh, I've been able to actually ask people to come on and talk about whiskey. We actually done a lot of that already. Um, I started at five thirty mainly because I get to walk the dogs and then I come and start drinking. So I might as well start drinking with people online. And uh, I've been trying to set up people to come on between six and seven, assuming that most people have lives and come in a little bit later. Um, so Anna Maria, I met you, it's like eight months ago? Probably at a whiskey fest. It was the, the no, beer, beer Baron. Remember Beer Baron? Beer Baron, okay. Cause I, I worked for Samson and Surrey before I worked for Teeling. So I, I felt like I might've met you when I was working at the Bren booth at a whiskey festival. You, you might've, I, I might've met you, but I was probably. <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah um so uh in a certain uh, to a certain extent i have a couple questions for for you and 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 about teeling and then i want to kind of open it up a little bit earlier than i did with with the other people because um i think you're such a teeling is such a new brand right that it uh that, that you're, you don't have as many bottles out there as other people, but, and also you have a, your interesting marketplace that you're going to. So you have your high end, but you've come out and said, I'm going to challenge Jameson too. It feels that way. So I'm going to let you kind of go with, with that. Yeah. So Teeling is a fairly new brand, but with a really deep history um, new generation of distillers bringing, uh, bringing whiskey making back to Dublin where the provenance of Irish whiskey really has its root. At one point in time, Dublin whiskey was really considered the best whiskey in the world, whiskey that was coming out of Dublin. Almost all the distilleries were in Dublin. This was before, of course, the fall of the category, before the consolidation, before Irish Distillers Limited got together with John Jameson and son and John Powers and son and consolidated down in Cork. And then 200 distilleries become only two operating distilleries. So I'm sure you guys know a bit about the, the history of the category, um, but we're poised in this really interesting moment now. It's a renaissance. So Irish whiskey is the fastest growing spirits category in the world. And again, deeply rooted in tradition, but with a mind to the future of the category and to innovation through cask maturation, really. Uh, Teeling is sort of leading the way for doing things a little bit differently, but also bringing distilling back to Dublin. So our logo is the phoenix, the phoenix rising out of the, the pot still. Hey, Frank. You're muted, Frank. Frank's on mute. Frank is our uh, uh, Teeling Regional Market Manager. I got you. So we work real closely together, uh, bringing the spirit of Dublin to everyone. I'm glad you could join us, Frank. I'm having a great time. Let's see. Hang on. Am I on mute or not? You're not now. Yeah. All right. Yeah, yeah. Good. So we're just sort of breaking into the brand story at the moment. Um, but uh, Fergus had said, you know, that we had uh, – maybe not so many bottlings as a lot of other Irish whiskey brands. So we're definitely, uh, you'd be amazed. We have over a hundred different cask types right now. We have over seven different genuses of wood. Uh, there's going to be a lot of single casks coming out, but of course the flagship range is our Trinity. So the Trinity is three of the four different styles of Irish whiskey. We've got the small batch uh, blend of grain and malt. So this is the one that falls into the category of, other blended Irish whiskeys, some of which you might be the, the dominating whiskeys of the category. Let's put it that way. Again, the blend, uh, we distinguish ours by not chill filtering on the one hand, by leaving the proof a little higher at 46% alcohol by volume, and then doing a second maturation in rum casks. So it spends uh, about a year in rum casks after uh, bourbon cask maturation. The next one in the Trinity is a single grain. So this one is the, the corn-based whiskey. This is uh, uniquely exclusively matured in Napa Valley wine casks. So not just finished in wine casks, but actually spends all of its maturation time in the wine casks, which is pretty, pretty awesome. We've got the single malt, 100% malted barley. 
this is a blending of five different wine casks. So this is a minimum of nine years old, up to 23 years, and it's five different wine cask influences. We've got some Madeira cask, some Oloroso sherry cask, port, white burgundy, and Napa cab. And then those five different casks are brought together into the single malt. And then we've just come out with the pot still, which is very exciting. This is the first single pot still. I saw someone else had it up there. Awesome. First uh, so single pot still whiskey uh, not produced by Middleton, uh, which is really exciting. First single pot still whiskey to be produced in Dublin since the 70s. Uh, and this is, um, this is our new baby. So just hit the shelves in January if you can get your hands on it. Uh, I'd love to, to hear what you think about it. This is three different cask maturations, so a little bit of virgin oak, a little bit of the ex-bourbon casks, and then some sherry cask finish as well. And of course, the pot still, to distinguish it from the single malt, is half unmalted barley. So it's a measure of malted barley and some malted barley, and then the three different cask types. And then we've got a whole bunch of single casks. I saw that you have some back there. Looks like you got one, two, three, four, five, six. You got seven different uh, expressions. Just the, the can canisters from the others. The, the other two that I have that are that are unique is the thirteen-year-old. Nice. Um, and then I have the chestnut. Awesome. And so this is this is. Can you guys tell me a little bit about the chestnut and kind of explain to people what's going on here? Because this the, is the, really an interesting flavor profile. The chestnut is my second favorite barrel I've ever tasted ever in my spirits industry history. And I go back to 79. Okay. So the number one was Louis the 13th, 1885. And this is number two. So the chestnut barrel itself is pretty darn cool. So um, Alex Chasco got word that um, a Solero house was going to sell off their Solero barrels, which doesn't happen. I mean, that just doesn't happen. But two brothers, one brother wanted out of the business, so the other one wanted to get bought out. So they went down, they took a look to start buying the barrels. They said, we'll do it. And they saw these three unique barrels sitting off to the side. And Alex says, what's those? What's that? And they go, no, no, you can't have it. You can't, you know. So the next year they come back to get the barrels and they ask again. The third year, finally, they go, you know what? You can have one of them. And he goes, well, what is it? I just wanted to know what it was. And what it is, it's a chestnut barrel uh, that is um, aged. For 90 years, it's held PX brandy in it. So they would make the brandy for the town and it would go into these barrels. And when you feel the barrel, you can squeeze the top rungs and it feels like a sponge. It's that porous. And it's the most porous barrel in the world. And you, any whiskey you put into it, three weeks later, it's completely changed. And uh, it, it is over the top delicious. Does anybody else have any of it? I know that I, I know I've introduced a few people to it because I brought some to our uh, event a few uh, this last October, but um, I, I went out and popped the bottle as soon as I found as, as soon as it came out of the market, I found it because it was it was really special. I was talking to Ed Ledger the other day from Ledger's Liquor, and he has two bottles left, and he's the only retailer that I know that has any uh, around. Yeah, um, Ledger's a good place to go. Um, outstanding. So, so go into it. Uh, do, is there a age range that's in here at all? Uh, the chestnut spends about 12 years in bourbon casks and then an additional two years in the chestnut casks. And after one year, it leaks totally through. The casks are leaking, they're weeping, they're black, totally saturated. And if you leave it in for any longer, you're going to lose a lot of whiskey to the angel's share. I think Alex, so Alex Tesco, that, who Frank mentioned, is our master distiller. Um, he was the head of innovation for uh, the previous distilleries uh, for the uh, Teeling Dad before the Suns opened the Teeling Distillery in Dublin. He's been with the company for a very long time. Super, super creative guy from the beer brewing industry. Um, and he's sort of leading the way with all of these interesting and unique casks. So the... Single cask does, I guess it doesn't have an age statement, but it does have a fill date and a bottling date. So it's all single malt. It's spending those first 12 years in the bourbon casks and then just finishing in the chestnut, but a whole two years and it gets so much flavor. One of the things that I think is so unusual about this particular wood is that texturally it gives the whiskey um, 
a viscosity. It gives me the impression of like, if you take two spoons and make a canal of butterscotch pudding, a sip of whiskey in your mouth is round like that with this chestnut influence. It's almost sort of a milky texture. It's super, super interesting, incredibly fragrant. And by law, Irish whiskey is some of the only whiskey that can legally use other kinds of hardwoods besides oak. So that's why we're able to have so many very different kinds of, uh, of barrels. So, so that, that kind of, the first question I asked, that's the, the, what I think is the interesting thing about teeling that I've seen is that you're, you're doing high and low, right? I, I feel like you got your $25 bottle, $20, $30 bottle that, and I saw your video about, oh my God, I want to tr try that recipe. Uh, the cold brew with um, looks, looks great, but you have the high low where you you're going, you're trying to make a very, very reasonably priced lower end whiskey. And then you're coming out with very experimental fun whiskeys that are going to start chat because it's a tough market to go low because fighting the Jameson's and the Tully's and that brand, that's a big, that's a market share. You're, you're going to have a hard time fighting. But then you're bringing out the higher brands that are uh, more sophisticated, more challenging, and that are going to... It's a very conscious better. decision on the part of the Teeling boys to go after it this way. We want whiskey that you can drink every day. You know, we want you to be able to afford our small batch. And you know, I got a bottle the other day for $28.99. You know, that's super affordable in my eyes for such a great whiskey. Mm -hmm. And you're right. We can't compete with the likes of Jameson or the Middleton guys there. They literally have an ocean of whiskey laid down where, you know, we have somebody's backyard swimming pool. So well, the only thing we can compete with was flavor. And that's where we're going after it. And some of these really unique bottlings are just a great way to get those words out and have some fun with it, you know, for you guys to be able to try things. Now, Sean and I had a big debate over this and uh, I'm going to meet you, Sean. Uh, Basically, uh, the concern I have with Irish whiskey is that um, the when, when you start going out and uh, doing so much experimentation, you start to lose what I think is called what Irish whiskey tastes like. But is it a bad thing or, or a good thing? I mean, for me, like my nostalgia says it's a bad thing, but then the interesting stuff you're going to bring out is pretty cool. And I'm concerned a little bit because again, I have this nostalgia for Irish. Sean is our Irish guy. He's, he's, he's as passionate about Irish as, as can be. I, and I, you know, we have the same argument back and forth, Fergus. I, I just see it as growth in Irish whiskey and I, Irish whiskey growing and transforming and getting better. Uh, I love Teeling, by the way, you guys are fantastic. I'm drinking, I'm drinking the, the single grain, and I enjoy the heck out of it. You know, that single grain is the oiliest whiskey in the world, too. And uh, if you guys have some right now of the single grain, uh, this is something I love to do. I'm going to have you take your single grain and pour a little bit in your hand. All right? And then when you pour it in your hand, rub your hands together, and it'll feel like lotion. Yep, feels just like the hand sanitizer my wife makes. <laughs> but it's so oily, and it's that oily because it's not chilled filtered, and none of our whiskeys are chilled filtered at Teeling. That's really important, so that's why they're all 46 alcohol or above. And when you chill filter, it's like taking a pot of chicken soup, and you put it in the refrigerator overnight, you get that fat cap. You strip the fat cap, you strip all the flavor. We're leaving that fat cap in there, and that's why all those are going. All right, Matthew, good job. Oh, Matt. That's my brother, by the hands, way. Matt, let's see it pour a little bit. So I did this, Frank, I did this all, all event in October because you had showed it to me. And the one thing that almost bothers me about it is kind of when I did that, then you smell your hands. Like I'm not going to get stopped by the cops. Like it does, the, the, the smell goes away and it really kind of goes into your skin and it doesn't just smell like you just poured booze on you. It's 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 a lovely smell. It, the flavor. It, uh, yeah. It's flavor. Yeah, it's that's what it is. Right. It's, it's, so the fatty acid combines with the phenolic acid, which we all know are phenols, and phenols are 
flavor. And that's what we're going after, you know, and, and that's why every experiment they try is they're hoping, you know, they're hoping for that big flavor uh, bomb. I'm so, just amazed. So Frank, Anna Marie, what do you think? I mean, Fergus is worried about the watering down of, of the Irish flavor, the Irish tradition. I'm on the other camp thinking that it, it's growing and changing and getting better and bringing back some of the history that was kind of lost when things got consolidated. But I think that innovation is really important for moving things forward. I think there's a place for nostalgia and a place for tradition. And that's the foundation that we build from. So, you know, we're not, um, we're sort of doing homage to the tradition by coming out with a pot still by, you know, making a whiskey that's true to the tradition of what Irish whiskey once was bold and spicy and textural meaty, something you can chew on and something that's very unique to the new whiskey consumer who might think of a blend as Irish whiskey. A lot of people who are new to the category might think that light, fruity, inoffensive are the character, the, the typical characterizations of Irish whiskey. But that's really only the Irish whiskey that people have been drinking for the last 20 or 30 years. Traditionally, single pot stilled whiskey was the uniquely Irish whiskey, and that was much again, spicier, oilier, meatier. So I think that it's important to acknowledge tradition and to do things with uh, a nod to the past, but I think that innovation is how we move the category forward. You know, I love the fact that you guys um, are bringing back that style of whiskey. Uh, to me, it's yeah. like, that's, that's really... That's really where Irish whiskey lives, is in, um, in, in, in single pot still. So let me ask you a question. Um, with, the EU, um, with the EU GI that is now out there, that's designating only malted and unmalted barley as being the only components in a pot still whiskey, are you finding that to be a... Um, um, a, uh, a restriction? Is it, is it constricting anything as far as your creativity? When you go back to those guys from, you know, when you go back to the Jamesons and the Powers and the Rose from, from, from that time period, they were, um, they were adding um, other grains in there, you know, as a, as a way of kind of differentiating. Um, and now with the, the EU has got, you know, very specifically, it's got to be this and, and can't be anything else. Um, is there a, 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 a is there any movement inside um, of the nascent uh, uh, Irish whiskey industry right now to actually you know move to bring some other grains back into that uh, into that mixture? Totally, and as a matter of fact, Alex Chesco is actually experimenting with crystal rye and chocolate barley and all different unusual grains. I think that the the constraint of the pot still category is not necessarily a problem for tealing um, because we're happy to fall, you know, our mash bill for our pot still is 50-50, 50, 50, 50 unmalted barley and 50% malted barley. So I think we've landed on a pretty satisfactory mash bill for that particular expression. But as far as um, innovation in mash bills for some of our other expressions, we're definitely still getting experimental and trying all different kinds of things. I'm actually doing a research yeah. project right now on the pot still category. And so I was reading that prior to the 80s, wheat was the primary grain that was used before corn really came in because mm -hmm. corn doesn't really grow very well in Ireland. So we get our corn from France for our single grain mm -hmm. and that we blend into uh, to the blend. Uh, but we're definitely using some other different kinds of interesting grains for some of our more experimental expressions. But they, they would be, they would be single like, pot. It's not, it's not all the way there yet. We're, you know, it's still young. We're, you know, compared to a um, red breast or the green spot and those guys, you know, they've got 20 year olds. We've got oh, three, yeah. four, five year olds. So right. we're still learning what that expression is going to truly finally come out as. So, right. you know, when people say, we say, hey, it can be a little bit of an ugly baby right now, but, you know, <laughs> give us years and see what happens because it's going to keep changing and getting better and better. Yeah. yeah. Well, Alex is really, I mean, Alex really is, uh, he's a brilliant guy. And, um, and we were having this conversation before you guys came on about passion. And, uh, and, and, and Alex is one of those guys that actually has the passion um, that is married with this, um, uh, steely discipline 
um, which is really what I admire about what he's bringing to uh, uh, to the whiskey. Um, uh, he still talks about whiskey as it's like a love affair. He uses a lot of romantic language um, uh, in making whiskey, which is great. This is exactly when you, what you want to hear from a distiller. But at the same time, you know, he's bringing this sense of, you know, a hardcore uh, steely commercial understanding of uh, actually wh where the market's at. And um, totally. Yeah. I mean, yeah. You guys are lucky to have him. He's a great guy. Agreed. And I, I understand that, you know, Ireland is a very small distilling community. And again, because we're in this Renaissance period and there's a lot of new distilleries opening all of the time, there still has for many decades been just a few players in the game. So a couple of months ago, I had the pleasure to meet Billy Leeton, who's the master blender at Middleton. Yeah. And when I introduced myself as the Teeling ambassador, he got really excited and he was like, you know, Teeling whiskey is the only whiskey in Ireland that I have not personally had a hand in blending. He said, I totally look up to Alex Chasco. I, I haven't had a chance to go visit yet, but I can't wait to. And he started asking me all these questions. And then when Alex Chasco came to town, I, I told him, I was like, I got a chance to meet Billy Leeton. It was so cool. He said how excited, you know, how hopeful he was to come visit Teeling and see what you're up to. And he's like, well, I've sent him a couple of invitations. So he's just got to take me up on him. But That's it's high break. Yeah, it's a small community. Yeah. And Alex is from Oregon? Yeah, he's from Oregon. So, um, now, why is Jack's name on the bottle, not Alex? Do you want to tackle this one, Frank? Yeah, sure. So, Jack's name is on the bottle because he is the uh, first owner of Teeling. Um, so, the Teeling family has been making, you'll see on our packaging, it says, uh, since 1782, but it's going to change from that to reborn uh, in 2012 in Dublin when we reopen there. So the boys themselves were working for their dad at Cooley, and when Bean came and bought them, the boys said, wait a minute, we're young, we're not done with this industry, we want to keep going. So Jack took his part of the profit of the family business and Stephen, and, and they opened up in, in Dublin. So Jack puts his name onto the bottle from there. And Alex will tell you, he is the number one employee, the first and number one employee. And uh, so, you know, down the road, I think you're going to see an Alex uh, special bottlings come out, but uh, not as of yet. We're still trying to grow just the word Teeling first to get people to know what it is. But uh, there'll be an Elmer T. Lee style bottle coming down the road in a few years. Now, how, how, how many, like, you want to have your three staples and does that, does that look like it's going to grow? Are you going to try and uh, have more than that? Or are you just going to have like the chestnut is it, how, how many more bottles of the chestnut or is it done? And you're going to just have these limited releases and then you're going to have your three staples. So we lead with the Trinity. Um, we've called it the Trinity because it's the small batch, the single grain and the single malt. Uh, the pot still being the fourth, different style of whiskey. Uh, again, just came out in the US in January. So this is our core range, are these four different mash bills, these four different styles. Um, we will continue to come out with single casks, which are typically left at cask strength around 55, 56% ABV. So the core range is all at 46. Uh, the single casks will be unfolding as they're ready. Um, we do have a couple of chestnut casks, um, very limited release. Uh, I, ha I don't know exactly what the capacity of the chestnut cask is, but an average barrel gets you about 200 bottles. Is that right, Frank? Uh, uh, probably a little bit more than that, actually. Okay. Yeah. So it's pretty darn close. But yeah, the, those chestnut barrels, we, only have, we now have three of them. And uh, so we will try to continue to do a chestnut from time to time. Uh, but it won't be an everyday staple. So if you think about it, it's the Trinity. The three will be on the shelves at all time. The single pot will come out once a year. It'll be released once a year. This year, we got 1,100 cases for the United States. So like I said before, we're on the infancy of this brand. You know, it's not huge yet uh, as it's going. And then uh, we'll come back to you guys a little bit later on this year, and we'll give you a sneak peek of a very special bottling that's going to be released again once a year. This will come out in January this year, and it's going to be a peated whiskey. So it will be the uh, second peated whiskey coming out of Ireland. Uh, 
and uh, and that is aged in Sauterne casks that go with it. Nice, much like our 24 year, which was the first Irish whiskey to win best single malt in the world at the World Whiskey Awards. But I'm super proud to work for the brand. We've won over, oh, Frank, you got a 24. Nice. I told Fergus he would have invited me in today. I was going to pour it for him, but. Uh... Oh, you, no, don't you even start. Wow, Fergus, no. you totally blew it, dude. No, okay. Damn. No, no, understand. I, so he tells me, I, he asked me which one of the Trinity, you know, which ones I have. Look, and he's him, he's said, scrambling for words here. This is great. Oh, I'm, 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 now I'm upset. He says, he says I, I tell him which one I'm missing, and he says, I'll, I'll come by before the tasting. I'll drop the bottle off for you. So sure enough, I'm like, great. I get to see Frank, which, I mean, last time he was here, I shared my my – the Pogue Castle 51 with you. Yeah, how I got home, I don't know. That was crazy last time. And so what does he do? I know that one. I get a message from him saying, hey, I, so I left the bottle in your little planner there. I'll see you tonight. Yeah, so he didn't even give me an opportunity to even see <laughs> that bottle. So no, oh no, oh no, mister, you can't get away we with it. We only that. live four miles apart, Fergus, so you, know, you should be here drinking more often. I Well, and... I haven't gotten an invite from you. I've invited you plenty of times. Yes, you have. Yes, you have. It sounds so, like you just got one, Fergus. I, I mean, it could have no, been no, me. It's, but... No, it's been awesome. Uh, so <laughs> the way Frank and I met was uh, uh, two years ago now almost. Um, there was a charity event, and he had set up a really great tealing basket. And I was, you know, in the running for winning it. And, of course – it's one of those things where timing is, is everything with these, with these bids. So I didn't get to the table before they shut the table and I lost it. And so then I, he, he was standing by the table talking to the, the people that were putting it on. And I said, I will match that price. If you get me another basket, absolutely. Absolutely. We'll take care of it. And so I went ahead and made the donation and then, few months go by and, and Frank's obviously way busy guy and, and nothing happens. But what the timing was, was impeccable because finally when we got together and he delivers the three bottles and, and several other things, which thank you again is amazing. Uh, I was able to bring it to uh, whiskeys of the world. And so all three bottles were sitting on the table for all of our members to, to try and drink. And, you know, a lot of people still don't know this brand. They haven't had this brand. So, and we'll be friends for a while. We, like you said, we, we live four miles away. Four miles away. Cheers. We can walk right. home drunk. You know, and Anna Maria <laughs> just lives on the other side of the bay. Uh, I'm in Oakland, actually. Oh, you're in Oakland. So why are you always doing events at like three? <laughs> Most of my events are targeted towards bartenders, and they mostly work, start work around four. <laughs> I, I pretend to make drinks in the afternoon. Uh, I'll have to go. Uh, yeah, mostly, uh, you know, my role as a brand ambassador is mostly advocacy, and most of my accounts are uh, are bars and restaurants. So I try to capture those folks when they're uh, when they're having their first meal of the day before they go in for their shift. <laughs> well, I think that's that's again that's the interesting thing about your brand. So, like last week, we we had Napogue Castle on here. Napogue Castle does not have a cheap brand. You know, they start at, I think, 50 and go on the, on up. And to be able to get to a bar and mix drinks and, and present it, you have, to, you have to be lower than that. The bartender, you know, the bar owners can't, can't typically afford the higher end uh, whiskeys for blending or mixing, mixing drinks. Um, so you, can, you, can you describe the, the, the blend, the, the, the drink that you made the other day online, because again, it was sounded delicious. And um, I think I need to try it. I know everyone else should try it too. For sure. So my, my personal background is as a bartender for 11 years. That's all I did every day was just make cocktails. So now when I'm lucky, I get to mix up drinks for friends or make a little cocktail demo video and post it on my social media. So the, the cocktail that I demonstrated yesterday was uh a cold coconut Irish coffee of sorts. So pretty basic, like fairly easy ingredients, a couple ounces of cold brew coffee, 
an ounce of coconut water. I find that um, the rum cask finish on the small batch is really delicious with coconut water, particularly because of the natural sweetness of the coconut water, the viscosity of it. Just, it's a match made in heaven. So if you ever have a chance to sip a little bit of this next to a fresh coconut, if you can get your hands on it, but the bottled or canned stuff would do in a pinch. Um, just a really beautiful pear. So an ounce of coconut water, two ounces of coffee. I use sweetened condensed milk uh, instead of sugar. So a little bit more texture, a little bit of creaminess and the sweetness. Uh, an ounce and a half of tealing small batch. Shook it up over ice, strained it into a cocktail glass, and then grated a little nutmeg on the top. It's It sounds spectacular, that's for sure. And I, I don't have the all the ingredients. I was going to try and get it today and I just didn't have a chance to go to the store. Um, and, and so one of the things I, I do want to do is, is set up maybe a, a little bit of a, at our uh, next tasting, hopefully it happens in October. If, if, if the vet does not destroy everything again, um, maybe do a, a tealing table specifically with, with some actual uh, cocktails because we don't do a lot of that and we've been talking about trying to do a cocktail station for only whiskey drinks you know that would mean no other alcohol right randy no yeah other no alcohol, alcohol just whiskey based uh, cocktails that sort of thing i still kind of think we should do it on a separate day do it the day before yeah i agree randy just just I, to not distract from the conversation i, I love it but it takes somebody away from the party to actually do we're, we're getting off topic here. We're going to 3D scene. That's fine. We need to do that. <laughs> we get off topic. And there can always be like an, an introductory cocktail or a pre-batch sure. cocktail that's just sure. like a welcome. Like I've so that, That's why I think it works. The, the, yeah. the reason I think it works is if we do one or two cocktails made by a specific brand that we're highlighting – so, so that that's, that's actually not a bad idea. Rather than having a separate table for this cocktail thing, why don't we set it up that at, so we, we always start our events at dusk because where it's a medieval event, half the people or most of the people don't have watches, but you know, when the big ball of light goes down. So we start at dusk. So if we set up, uh, you know, half an hour before dusk, then we have been setting up pretty good lately, set up half an hour, uh, half an hour before dusk. And we actually have cocktails, whiskey cocktails before the whiskey party as a, a aperitif sort of thing. That'd be outstanding. And, and it's a great way to cleanse the palate too. When you're drinking a bunch of whiskey to slow down for a second, reset your palate. That's and you're both invited to come if you would like. We're just going to put you in funny outfits, though. That's it. Can and you fit me, Fergus? You got one big enough for me? Yes, we do. <laughs> you know, this is the one group that says yes, we do. <laughs> um, yeah, no, absolutely. I'm and, not and, and small if, by any means. Well, no, and if you can, so it's in Taft, so it's a few hours down. So if you guys came out, we would make sure to. It would be a, it's a camping event, so we we would set up a some sort of arrangement so you can camp there. Um, we we drink responsibly. We only drink <laughs> at camping events where you can pass out. And, I, and, and Frank, I would say it's a great Irish type of event too because we drink all night, then I get up in the morning and I fight all day. So it's just brilliant. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> I do love that idea. Oh, it's fantastic. I do love well, that idea. It's it's a fun weekend, um, and and we would definitely encourage it if you guys wanted to come out. Dan's been out. Dan can Dan can, can explain his experience there. Uh, I don't know if you guys know Dan. Um, he, he go ahead and introduce yourself, sir. What's going on? I'm Dan. Hey, Dan. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the event's a lot of fun. It's uh, it's definitely different if, if you've never been, but uh, it's it's a good experience. And then uh, whiskey is amazing. I mean. I think when I went, uh, Adrian, I think we had like 200 whiskeys or something like that. It was, it was we had 100, 100, 100, 120. It was up there. Here was 140. All right. I mean, that's, um, that's it felt like 300. But considering it's all donated whiskey, it's pretty impressive. You know, it's it's uh, that that's how our event works. Is we we uh, we all just donate in. Um, I was. I want to bring in unique and fun whiskeys. That's why when I, I thought about hoarding the uh, tealing in my my house and not taking it out there, but Frank dropped it off literally like two weeks before the event. And I was, 
All right, that's kismet. I have to, I have to take it out there. That's, that's, that's what I got to do. But uh, and you know where my garage is. You can always come get more. What was that? I said, you know where my garage is. You can always come get more. Well, I mean, I, I, I like buying the whiskey too. Like, and I know that sounds super, super stupid because I now have a lot of friends in the industry and I, I know I don't have to buy a lot of whiskey. I want to buy it because that's, what, it. that's really we what you guys that. live off of. So I appreciate the offer. I'll, I'll do it. Yeah, end of the day, the 3DC are enthusiasts. We're not really looking for free drams all over the place. We're looking for the new, unusual, and different drams. So sure. we don't mind paying for it if we have to. Unless but, it's that 24-year that you can't find anymore. Yeah. Where was the last bottle you saw, Anne-Marie? And it was only like 500 bucks, right? Yeah, I saw a couple bottles uh, when I was in out by Chico, and I couldn't contain my shock at the low price because they, I, you know, there was such a very limited amount to this, and it had been gone from everywhere I'd been for months. And I saw it, and I was got so excited. I was like, "Wow, that's a great price!" And the store owner said, "Is it? Well, then it's two hundred dollars more." <laughs> I was like. Damn it! <laughs> if only I kept my mouth shut. <laughs> <laughs> so, so next time, Anna Maria, I, I am this guy. Buy it, and I will, I will, I will pay you a ten percent commission, and we'll just go with it. <laughs> next time, I'm going to buy it for me, and I'll share it with you. How about that? <laughs> no, that doesn't work for me. <laughs> All right, it fine. works for me. Uh, I'm in. You're okay with her sharing for me? No, not you. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I'm going to open it up to anyone that wants to ask questions. I mean, I, I don't want to, like, I, I already know I love the whiskey. I've got it. I've had it for a while. Um, I, I keep buying it. I love the chestnut. That's a pretty interesting whiskey. Um, so anyone else have anything they want to ask? Hey, uh, Frank, I've actually got a uh, question about that chestnut barrel. Um, so you mentioned before that it was sort of like uh, the consistency of it was very spongy, yep. right? So is that, uh, is that the, the nature of chestnut, or was that because it, was, it had been uh, soaked in whiskey for that long of a time, or what's, uh, what, what's the, the details behind that? So that is the nature of the chestnut barrel. That's why you don't use chestnut. They... Years and years ago, a couple of centuries ago, chestnut was used in cognac uh, for their barrels, but they were so porous, you know, you'd lose 15, 20% a year out of them, and that was too much for them. Um, so the barrels themselves, I'm going to put up, uh, I don't know if you guys can see this or not, um, the barrel itself. Is that coming through? Yeah, overall. Yeah. So you see how black yep. the barrel is on the side? Yep. You can't have hear to you, replace Dave. the head. The head is so poor. Can't hear you. We can't hear you, Frank. Can't and hear come you. Come back the next day and have it be half empty. Hey, Frank, we didn't we didn't hear you when you had the uh, the photograph up there. So can we? Oh, okay. That? Thanks. Can we All right. So the barrel itself, um, you have to replace the heads because they're so porous that they, um, you can fill a barrel, come back tomorrow and be half empty because they, they can't get enough pressure on them and they'll leak out. And then on the outside of the barrel, you saw how black the barrel was? If you put your hand on it, it's like stick them in football used to be. It just literally is like, you know, pulls off because there's so much loss coming through there that that barrel is, is like that. And so right. when literally the top of it, you grab it by your hands and you squeeze and it's like a, a sponge, a wet sponge, not a dry sponge, but a wet sponge squeezing in and out. And have that's they, how they, uh, it's going in and out. Have they, they ever, have they ever considered using the uh, oak barrels and putting the chestnut inside? Uh, I don't know if they've considered that one because we only have those three, so they don't want to break them down. Uh, but uh, that might be something that comes down the road with the popularity of the chestnut. Um, do more like a zebra barrel or uh, an interstave, you know, kind of a thing. Yeah, you, as far as that goes, you can make a laminar setup where your your inner your inner surface for an inch of the inner surface is the chestnut, and the outer surface is is uh, you wouldn't want to use oak. You'd want to use something softer because you want the woods to move together. But you could use something less porous yet soft 
for the outer woods and that's sorry engineer taking over but uh <laughs> you could, well no that's actually that. exactly where i was going with it raz so I, that's why i'm glad you said that yeah wouldn't be a bad idea if it's if it's working for me it's selling why not yeah you know and see that's one of the cool things about the, the tealing boys is alex comes and says hey i'm gonna buy aqua beat barrels and they're like what are you talking about you know, because if you don't fill it, you never know if it's going to be good or not, right? Or gin barrels or Riesling barrels. Uh, you know, if you, you got to put something in them to see how it turns out, you know, and it, it might be the worst whiskey in the world, but it also could be the best. But if you don't fill it, you never know, right? And so a lot of people come to Alex because he's kind of known as the grandfather of barrel finishes now, um, you know, because of that, because, you know, we have so many different barrel types. And I'll tell you, if you ever get a chance to go to Green Ore, that's where we keep all our barrels is on Green Ore. It's up almost to the North, uh, Northern Ireland border. Um, when you go in with Alex, you literally go in with a drill and you drill into the barrel, pulls out and catch the whiskey in a glass. You pull a little wooden plug and plug it back up. And, uh, but the best way to taste everything is start to question Alex on why he does something. And then he'll want to prove why he does it. And then we just taste barrel after barrel after barrel. Oh, my God. It's so amazing. It's just so awesome. So this is what we should do when we go to visit? Yes. 100%. And the other insider trick is you fill four flasks or bring four empty flasks in your pockets. So when you're going around and you find those barrels, you fill it up uh, as you find that barrel you love. It's almost guaranteed that they'll be empty by the time I get to those barrels. So I, I, I got the four flasks, no problem. All right, Frank, you've done this to me a lot, a few times, but but so I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna challenge you now. What is that cool, awesome thing? And don't worry, we're only videotaping this. Uh, what is that cool thing that's coming out or that you know about that no one else knows about? You guys, it's the peated whiskey, the peated whiskey. Uh, that we're gonna have. Uh, now, it, how it, how heavily peated? What's that? How heavily heavily peated is it going to be? I think it's fifteen parts per million. Uh, so more on the lines of like a Highland Park than a uh, Isla whiskey. Uh, I'm that. not positive about yeah. that. That's you know that's something that they haven't put out the final numbers or all those kinds of things yet. It is uh, like aged in bourbon barrels and in um, Sauternes casks and Chateau Yukem. So that'll be very unique and interesting there. Cool. Uh, and then we're going to continue to come out with some single barrels. So we're going to have some hardwood barrels coming out. Um, and then uh, we're going to have some uh, single barrels at Total Wine, BevMo, uh, and Costco uh, that are going to be super unique barrels, really out of the ordinary uh, things for you guys. Costco? <laughs> I know. They asked for it. We weren't selling it to them. They asked for it. Hey, so, some of us need teeling whiskey at Costco so we can get our hands on it. Yeah, as soon as, as, soon as they come out, we'll let you guys uh, all know when they're uh, hitting the market. And uh, we can get out and have some fun with it that way. Yeah, feel free to uh, join up on the uh, 3DC Facebook group, group and you can just spam it when it comes out and then we'll all get it. Beautiful. And even, even better if you can provide locations they're going to as well. Yeah. Uh, 100% on that one, and I always try to get it so if you guys, you know, like this last chestnut, it came and went so fast, um, you know, we were telling people about it, and it was already sold out at the stores, so we try to get it to you guys before, so you can get it before it's gone. Yeah, usually very... at, at Ledger's Liquors is a, a spot, Ed Ledger usually picks up the, we, we go to him first because he's been such a good partner. So if you're anywhere uh, near Berkeley, that's a good place to look first. Anne Marie, here's the problem: is that only works for me because I'm the I think I'm the only one that's Bay Area here. Uh, uh, and so Cali's are. That's what's cool about this group is this group is pretty much. You've got Tennessee. We had New a few minutes ago. We got Florida. We got Delaware. So this, this there's a, the spread is pretty strong here. Uh, Ledger's is yeah. I, I, that's where I got my general uh, compass box. And I go to Ledger's all the time. They're spectacular. Um, that's where I got my chestnut, actually. They had gotten it the day I walked into the store. Oh, nice. um, and one place. other thing I'll mention about single casks is that we have a lot of really fun partnerships with other distillers and brewers and producers that Alex respects or admires. So if, you know, uh, I want to almost said Peter Gabriel 
it's not Peter Gabriel. What's the uh, Pierre Ferrand master distiller? Peter Gabriel's a musician. Yeah. Um, Alexander Gabriel. Alexander, yeah. Yeah. So uh, we've partnered with the Pierre Ferrand um, Plantation Rum producer to use some of their casks. We've used the Trois Rivieres uh, Agricole Rum casks. Um, the one that I'm really excited about that I heard we're not actually going to get our hands on because it's too limited, but will be uh, released distillery only is the Plantation Pineapple Rum single cask. Oh. oh my God, I tried it. It's ridiculously good. So excited. You know, I was to, when people ask me, what's the difference between Irish whiskey and Scottish whiskey? You know, what, they always want something, you know, to be different between the two. And, uh, and I tell them that Irish whiskey is very fruit forward. Scottish whiskey is very cereal forward, you know, because we have that Atlantic current that comes through for us. And that pineapple just, it's so subtle, but it's so brilliant in that whiskey. It's just so nice. We were drinking it when we were over there. Can I get my hands on this? I think it's going to be a distillery exclusive. Best, you need to start carrying your baggage behind you? Four miles away. I think you just need to go to Ireland, buddy. I'm in. Let's go. Oh, yeah, I know. Uh, so you're bottling, the bottling of the company. I, 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 one, I love this bottle. It's a, it's a weapon. I can put a stick on this thing and hurt people. Uh, is there a is there a reason is there is there a story behind this bottling because again it's thick it's it's heavy uh it's beautiful obviously it's for your special bottlings but any any reason for it all i know personally and maybe frank has a little more knowledge than i do about the decanter style bottle um that was for the revival expressions and then for some of the older age statement whiskey, that special sort of crystal decanter style. Uh, our normal bottle shape and size and color is very purposeful. This is the, the shape of the old whiskey from Dublin was a bottle like this. This is the Dublin bottle shape and it's not actually black. It's a green glass. It's Dublin green. So everything from the shape of the label, the, the shape of the bottle, the color of the glass of the core range is very purposeful. I imagine there's greater purpose than the decanter style of the Revival uh, series in the 24 year. Do you know about that bottle, Frank? No, from what I know about the bottle itself is that Jack and Steven wanted something extra special to be able to uh, let people know that it's different, uh, differentiated and let you know it's quality. Uh, I'll have to find out why the shape of the bottle is there. But Jack said, you know, first impressions are everything. So when you pull the cork, it weighs a ton. This thing has got some heft to it. And he wanted you to know when you pull that cork, hey, something special is coming to you. Uh, you know, when I was at your distillery, story. when I was at your distillery um, in, the, in, in that great museum you guys have uh, on the bottom floor, um, You've got some a terrific lineup of all of the old ancient bottles from uh, from the Dublin days, and that that bottle kind of re is reminiscent of uh, of some of those ones that I actually saw during that time. I don't know if that was maybe the inspiration or not. Yeah, that could be it too. And do you guys know why there's an E in Irish whiskey? Oh yeah. <laughs> all right, good. What what's your wait? I want to hear your story. My story. Yeah. All right. Uh, well, you know, I know we got some Scots here, you know, so we won't, you know, tell them that it's just, you know, too much ink, so why waste the money? But uh, uh, the <laughs> real reason behind it was that I tell is that um, when the French came out with the AOC, the Irish, and especially Dublin, were making the best whiskey, and they wanted to make it different. So Dublin whiskey started to put the E in it, so that way you knew it was from Dublin. And you'll see bottlings of things, you know, that say – Dublin whiskey on it, even though it's Northern Ireland or has the E in it, even though it has nothing to do with Dublin itself. And people, you know, said that was, you know, synonymous with quality. And that's kind of where it came from. For That's the story I like to tell. How about you, Robin? Is that close? Um, yeah, yeah, that is. Uh, it was specifically um, Peter Rowe. Yes. It was specifically Peter Rowe. Um, uh, are you familiar with the truths about whiskey? One more time. The, are you familiar with the truths about whiskey? 
No, I uh, looked that up. Is it a book? It's the book I that did. said that. Uh, go ahead. It's a book that uh, that Jameson wrote, um, where um, it was a, sort of a ninety-page uh, trolling of the of the column still, and uh, it was the the advocacy of um, of uh, of pot still of Dublin style pot still whiskey versus um, this infernal machine that this uh, that this man was trying to sell them. The and, uh, spirit. Yes. What was yeah, that? I forgot. I, I didn't the put the spirit. name to it, but yeah, this, yeah, the, no, the, no. The, Oh, let me let me tell you. They called it much worse than the silent spirit. Uh, according to him, uh, it was going to actually break up the family and steal your children and, and, and everything. Um, but um, so that was part of the campaign against uh, uh, the, the, the evils of the column still or the, the coffee still. And uh, and they all took their they all took shots at it. And it was uh, Peter Rowe's descendants that stuck that E in there. Um, as the differentiator between their Dublin style pot still, um, uh, pot still whiskey and what was coming out of uh, Scotland at that time. And, um, and then, th then you had the, uh, the, the age of the saloon in the United States and you can see where the crossover went right there. So it was the, all the, the Irish, um, uh, the Irish saloon keepers, in the United States sort of like transferred that over. So for me, that's like, that's like, you know, there's, there's a thousand stories. It's kind of like, how did bar barrels get charred? You know, there's a thousand stories for that. Oh, yeah, and, Elijah uh, Craig. yeah, yeah, right. Yeah. Elijah Craig. And yeah, then, you know, all kinds of stuff, you know? Um, but uh, to me, I, it, when I, when you start searching through the history of it, that one seems to actually kind of like hit all, most of the dots right, right. there. Um, the, the Victorians were very, uh, the Victorian mindset at that time was very, very uh, keyed into style and uh, and typeface and and spelling and uh, and syntax. So it, it it fits right in with you know just make one little change and that was really all you know all they needed you know so. That's interesting. I'm always hearing new bits and pieces that inform the historical trajectory. And I love the fact that we, you know, I've been in this business 40 years and I'm still learning something every day. You know, that's what's so much fun about it. Yeah. I mean, we've been, we started our, our group 20 years ago and it's like, no I, kidding. I know nothing compared to, you know, every I, and more stuff keeps rolling in. Everybody in our little group, they come to me, they come to Fergus, they come to Seamus, they come to Sean looking for it. Well, for Sean about Irish, um, they, they come to us looking for information about whiskey and they think we're gods of whiskey and we know everything. It's like, I am no sage. You know, there are so many people that know so much more than we do. Yeah, we are that meme. We are that meme that when we walk into the Total Wines and the guy goes, "Hi, can I help you?" I'm like, right, "Don't worry, I know more than you." Never mind. Yeah. You know? <laughs> so, so we're at that weird crossroads. But uh, yeah, I go no, to High Time Wine and I help people. No, pick. can I help you? Come on, yes. yeah. <laughs> yeah. We all do that. I mean, you know. Yeah. Not bad. Um. All right. Do you guys have anything to, uh, I mean, I'm going to cut this, I'm going to cut the recording off real soon, but do you guys have anything you want to uh, talk about anything, the events coming up, any, anything you want us to be aware of? You know, I'd love to say we got a ton of events coming up right now, but you know, everything's on hold. As soon as they do, we'll let you guys know because we're planning to do some Phoenix rising parties, you know, with uh, the Phoenix. Uh, Emery, did you talk about that part of, uh, uh, the label and why we do that? I was just starting to mention it when you popped on and then I got excited to see you and switched gears a little bit. But yeah, you might've noticed that our, our logo is a Phoenix rising from, from the pot still to indicate the revival of Irish whiskey and the new beautiful future. So it's very appropriate imagery for what we're all going through right now. So when this all breaks, we're planning on doing some parties out there, you know, with all you guys and get you guys together. We'll find out all the different states you guys are in. You know, we're going to have them in Florida and other, you know, states throughout the, the flyover. So hopefully the state you guys are in, you can come to the parties and be there with us. Yeah, absolutely.